welcome. <laughs> welcome to the talk discussion. <laughs> nice you. to have you on board. Um, as I said in the email, I'm here to answer your questions, but uh, if you don't have anything specific, particular, I can also just tell you what I would be doing right now in terms of investing. Please. Okay. Yeah, maybe you, you introduce you quickly what your needs are, Jan. Okay, sure. My name is Jan Auerkerk. Um, I've started investing a long time ago, uh, but I don't have any experience with stocks uh, at all. Uh, in fact, up until recently, I wasn't interested in stocks, but now I am. The uh, reason for that is that I see um, that the last two months, more money has been printed than in the last 200 years, which means for That's me true. that, yeah. It's crazy, it's, really? It's actually wow. a fact, yeah. Um, which means for me that um, hyperinflation or inflation, possibly deflation is coming and I need to protect myself. Uh, it also means that current interest rates uh, are negative in Switzerland. Uh, we invest in different countries, so there are zero interest rates. Um, so basically, the intention is to understand value, value stocks, to build up a portfolio, which is not a portfolio that I'm going to use for daily usage. It's mainly like, yes, I am a bit older, older but uh, yes, it is for a pension fund type of thing. Um, I read your website extensively. I appreciate what you're saying. And um, the one thing that, stri that struck me most was that you better take things in your own hand. And that is my experience as well. Um, the experience so far with what, what, uh, what they call themselves financial professionals has been really very poor. And uh, I think that's why I'm here. So I'm here to learn. I'm here to listen. I'm here to hear different viewpoints and take it from okay. Uh, Terrace, maybe you want to go next? Yeah, I, mean, we've, I don't think we've ever seen each other, but we've written to each other a few times. Okay. So I, I, I uh, teach at the University of St. Colin, okay. and I started up this, this idea. I'm going to make a movement kind of like Black Lives Movement, except for financial, for wealth inequality, fighting wealth inequality by getting everyone invested. Because we know that over time, the stock market does better. Cap owning capital is better than owning cash. And so my thing is to try to get everyone invested. Um, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with the stock market. I'm quite familiar, familiar with the tools and everything, and the numbers and the ratios and everything like that. But trying to get everyone invested is a challenge. And I wanted to hear how you address that challenge of trying to get everyone to own the economy, to own the biggest com companies in the economy so that wealth inequality is in, is addressed with financial literacy. Yeah, um, this is really one of the core things. And actually, since Jan has joined us also to learn more about um, uh, how he could do, uh, he could manage his own portfolio, I can probably uh, a little bit go into that before we start. Um, uh, the, the idea, basically of our website is to make the financial side of the analysis a lot easier than it, it is right now. Uh, you know, no matter where you go, typically uh, the providers of financial information want to give you as much information as possible. And uh, some people know that if you get too much information, you actually get lost and you feel less secure uh, making a decision. So I, have made decisions what information I found find important for investors on the financial side. And I do this with an econ economics background. So I studied at St. Colin, did my doctorate there. Um, and my passion was really finance for a long time. And I started this a little bit with a similar experience than Jan. I wasn't happy with the options I had to invest. Uh, I, I did some investing in the dot-com bubble, which went uh, wrong. I then moved to index funds where, you know, I thought this is a good way of investing in the stock market without too much effort. And then I realized that, uh, that these index funds are not really um, what I would like to, where I would like to invest. Very often when you look at those index funds, they contain stocks that you wouldn't really choose. So you're, you're, you're in a straight jacket and you basically have to just go with whatever they think is, is the right stock for you. So if you invest right now in the US, you uh, involuntarily are a high tech stock investor because right now 
the tech stocks in the in the in the large uh, Standard Poor's 500 index dominate the index, the returns. So, is that really what I would like to do when I want to invest in the U.S.? Not really. It's very similar in Switzerland when you invest in the SMI. You now invest heavily in pharmaceutical companies because they did really well. If you did that before the 2008 crash, you would be heavily invested in financial companies because they did very well prior to the crash. So I realized that you know investing in an index fund, first of all, doesn't really give you what you think uh, you receive. It also doesn't give you the entire market. You know they do that. They, they say that they have all the stocks in the market, but you know, they weight the stocks. They cannot put the same money in each stock because that would be unmanageable. So what they do is they weight it by market cap. You're certainly aware of that. But that also means that you're not getting all the returns. You're getting a, getting a weighted return from the market. So an index fund I realized is actually a lot more arbitrary than I, than I thought. And I decided I would like to invest uh, in the stock on my own, but I wasn't the type that spends a lot of time thinking about where I would invest. You know, I, I don't want to study the, the stocks in, in detail. But if I pick stocks, I still want to know a little bit about them. So for me, uh, it all started with the financial side. I wanted to know, is that stock rather expensive? Is it rather cheap? And I also wanted to know, is it growing or not so much growing? And then, you know, after, because Enron was one of my stocks I held in the dot-com bubble, I wanted to know how they're financed. Are they more on the risky side or on the safe side? Enron, Enron was actually a company which was highly leveraged. And if you were careful, you would have probably not invested in Enron. So you would have not been um, a victim of the fraud there. And I realized, you know, if I, if I make a filter and say like, okay, stocks that have more equity, more capital than others or more cash flow in relation to their debt are, are typically safe for finance and are less likely um, to be, um, uh, uh, to be fraudulent. You know, also Wirecard, when you look at the older ranks, Wirecard had, had quite high leverage compared to other banks. So, you know, sometimes you can actually, by just looking at the financial side, at the, at the safety side, you can, you can be safer if you focus on the less leveraged uh, companies in the market. And now when I come back to Jan, I mean, that, that basically when I then decided to develop that, that method of, of ranking the stocks, of, you know, according to these three criteria, is it expensive? Is it, is it safely financed? And as a last check, does it grow or not? Or often this is just an explanation of what you see. And I decided I'm, I'm using very simple, uh, but also very uh, popular metrics to do that. You know, and you, when you go to my website and you look at the financial metrics, you will actually see things that you've seen before. Maybe on the on the financial leverage side, when it's about security, you haven't thought about that that much and you haven't seen those metrics that much, but they're very typical metrics. I also wanted to, to turn that into something digestible. And the, this rank system from, from zero to 100, or from one to 100 to be precise, uh, makes it very simple to understand if that metric actually is a good metric or not. So a good, a good, a good value metric would actually mean the price earning ratio is low. So it, 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 would, it would exactly show you what you would expect to show. Uh, a good value metric doesn't mean that stock is expensive, it means it really is good value. The same thing with growth, you know, good growth metrics obviously are growth companies and with a safety metric again, uh, when there's less leverage, it's better. So it's reverted. So I made sure that you can really easily read those metrics. And uh, when you then basically use those metrics as a starting point, there's not so much left that you actually have to look at. You, you want, want to maybe know what products they sell, how the management team is. You want to know their reputation in the market. These are other things that you could use in a simple, for a simple buy and hold decision. And everything that goes on top of that, how professionals are trying to make money is by being smarter than what you see in the market. And that takes a lot of effort. And I decided to leave that to the user, basically. If you decide, I wanna spend a lot of time understanding why this company is good value or understanding why this company is so expensive, 
and then and then make an investment decision, you can do that. But the system makes it easier to come to a quicker uh, uh, to a quicker. Um, Gibt es etwas anderes, bei dem ich helfen kann? Oops, what is really? That's funny. There's somebody else who wants to join us. Dominic's now somebody else. So um, I'll let him join. Uh, so, so really, this is this is really what what I'm doing with my system. Any questions by now? Um, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. It helps me also in having a look at your website again, and I need some time for that. Um, I understand your approach. So basically, you're looking at uh, at basic metrics and then ranking them to order. That's that's what I understand of it, right? Yes, exactly. I'm using the metrics. They're all on the website. Yeah. So when you click on them, you see the definitions. Yeah. And uh, I turn them into ranks that are easy to understand. Yeah. On top of them, when you have ranks, you can rank them. Yeah. So you can make top ten list. You can filter them. And, uh, and basically uh, find stocks that are better suited from a financial perspective. Yeah. Or you can do the other thing around. You see a company you really like a lot and you want to know how good are the financials actually for you as an investor. And maybe because it's a popular stock and because uh, you've heard about it, maybe then it's, it's an expensive stock. And you may come to the conclusion, okay, the value is not that high, but it's still a really attractive stock and I, I think I still want to invest. So I did that for instance with Logitech. They had a value rank of about 40 out of 100. So it was a, a rather expensive stock, but I thought 40 is actually not that expensive for Logitech. You know, it should actually be maybe on 20 or something. So I still decided to buy even though the rank was low. The rank, especially the value rank, I mean, the, the, the safety rank is clearly, to, you know, it's very clear. It doesn't mean it's a safe company, it just means they're safely financed. But that's, then it's clear, you know, more is safer. Yeah. And the growth rank is also quite in, easy to interpret. It means basically things that, that the KPIs there have been growing over the last uh, 12 months. It's always a rolling process of the last uh, four quarters. And um, when it comes to the value rank, uh, uh, it really, it's only a reflection of what you see in the market. So if you have a really attractive company like Google or Facebook, they're very expensive. So the value rank would be very low. Yeah. So this only gives you an information of what the market thinks about the future of the company. And I found very often, I found uh, companies that are cheap compared to their peers. And um, I thought they should not be cheap. And this is actually then a good reason to invest. So I've prepared a couple for you for, for today, if you want to look at that. Yes, thank you. So, you know, I, one case, um, if you're on the premium mailing list, you've received yesterday my, my um, uh, blog that I would sell Tesla. And I explained why I think Tesla is, a, is an expensive stock. But um, there are actually... Uh, other car stocks that are now extremely cheap. So you, can you see it? Yep. Okay, is it, is it large enough for you? Yes, thank you. Thank you for asking, yes. So um, automotive. Uh, so basically when I look at that, this is my fil this is my watch list. So I added a couple of stocks to the watch list that I found through the filter. You know, I went to the filter and uh, the last thing I, I, I searched for was, not, was technology stocks in North America. I found a couple and then basically you can also find the cheap technology stocks. We can also talk about them today, but let's start with the automotive first. So when I go at automotive, um, you can see that uh, Renault is the cheapest stock, has almost no growth. So you would expect that this stock is actually cheap. You know, it is quite riskily financed. It's only one. So, so Renault, you know, is a really good value stock, but it's not growing at all, has lots of debt. I don't think it's that attractive. No. When you go to Volkswagen, now you have a company that has lots of value, is actually growing above average at 60, which means 60th percentile, 60% 60 of the other automotive stocks are actually growing less, but it's quite riskily financed too, you know? 
So um, when you look at um, Volkswagen, um, they do a lot of financing. So when they sell a car, they, they don't get the money. They give the car for free and then they have a leasing with the customer and the customer pay back, has to pay the leasing back and eventually he pays the rest value of the car. That means that that company Volkswagen is almost like a bank. It, yeah. And for that reason has a lot of debt. <laughs> yeah. So maybe that safety rank in this industry is a little bit, you have to interpret it. You know, so it's not as important as uh, as in other industries where there is less of a leasing business. And it's actually quite difficult to get the leasing business out of the financial numbers. So we, 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 we didn't, we couldn't do that yet. So you go to the next one, Peugeot, again, no growth, but then BMW, you see, BMW has a value ranking of 80 growth, you know, lots of growth. Okay, it's riskily financed, but less so than, than, than Volkswagen. So I find that actually an attractive car manufacturer now, currently. They are so cheap, probably because everybody thinks Tesla is going to take their business away. That's at least what you read in the press. But when I look at Tesla, I don't think they have any monopoly power, like, for instance, Google has or Amazon has. Tesla doesn't have that protection against the competitors. So it may have, it may have a really good business model, but it doesn't have... Uh, Tesla, you know, a really good product, I want to say, a really good car, but it doesn't have the protection that uh, a Facebook or a, a Google has. And for that reason, I think it's not really justified that Tesla is more expensive than, you know, many of the other car manufacturers together. So if I would have to decide uh, what to invest, BMW would really be a stock that I would be interested in. Or for the matter, Volkswagen, where it's even safer financed, Saab, you know, but then they have less growth. Or then Daimler. You see, and again, Daimler, I think the safety rank here is probably due to their financing business. This is known that Daimler has a big financing arm. So in this case, I'm not so worried about the financing side. For that special, but this is, you have to then, you have to know uh, that this is, this is, this is a, a special situation with their business model. And so, you know, a, a stock that I find interesting now to look at are German uh, automotive companies, because right now, because of Tesla, uh, they, they are, um, they're not very uh, much uh, popular and are probably cheap. So this is a place where I probably would buy a stock. As a matter of fact, I just bought BMW and Daimler recently. So this is an idea of how to use it, how to use basically the stock search. Did you ever do some research on, let's say, uh, the predictability of debt in a company relative to its future performance? Well, we can measure the future performance really because it's in the future. So uh, an analysis like that is really difficult. Okay. Um, what I do is I look at that uh, more carefully if I expect a recession. Mm -hmm because then that is a problem. Yeah. If, if I'm confident about the future, then I, I'm, I'm less worried about that. Mm -hmm. um, because that's also an important thing. If, if it goes up, if the economy goes up, it basically means that is good because all the returns go to the shareholders. Yeah. <laughs> so if you are, you know, if you're confident about the future, you would buy companies with lots of debt. I have two questions. Yeah. The first question is, is that that data is, is a snapshot of right now? Always, yeah. The most recent snapshot. So there's no historical data, there's no historical data involved. Yes, there is. I mean, the growth rank can only be, you know, assessed in relation to uh, the past. So how uh, much historical data is incorporated in that analysis? We do it on a rolling basis and we always use the last four quarters related to the previous four quarters when we calculate the growth rank. Okay. And can I ask you where you're getting data from? Uh, Standard Poor's and uh, Refinitiv, Thomson Reuters are our data providers. And what was the other one? Fide uh, Fidelity? Reuters, Refinitiv, yeah. Okay. Are the data providers we use. Okay, and may I ask you how many companies are in your database? About 10,000. 10, okay, and global, the United States, England, Germany, yeah. Austria, Switzerland, 
everywhere. Absolutely, yeah. And how did you pick those 10,000, may I ask? Uh, we decided to, to pick the, the, the largest 10,000 worldwide. That's how we got there. Uh, so they're all large caps? Yeah, not really. I mean, uh, in the world, we have about 1,600 large cap companies. Mm -hmm. And the rest uh, are, are smaller, you know. I mean, in a traditional sense of large cap, if you think IBM or, you know, yep. uh, about the large cap. What we do is, you know, in terms of size, we have size classes. Again, we try to make it as easy as possible. We have XXL, XL, and going down. And um, we have, I don't know the number exactly, but probably about 600 of those 10,000 are XXL. Another 600 are XL. Another 600 maybe are, are, are L. And mm -hmm. then, you know, M is already mid size, is middle, you know, in terms of size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we don't calculate it based on market capital only. We also use invested capital, uh, revenues, profits, and employees. Okay. And, and everywhere, at any point, you can look at that and, and see what each of those categories entail, incorporate. But we don't update that on a, on a daily basis because these are quite stable uh, figures. What do you update on a daily basis? Uh, nothing. Okay. Yeah, we do weekly updates. Every week, we use new uh, share prices for about a, a fourth of a fourth of all the stocks, so that over one month, uh, all ten thousand are updated with their most recent stock price. Is that in this with the volatility index where it is right now? Isn't that a little um, risky? No, you can filter for the stocks that have just been updated. So if you don't want to look at, at, at stocks that are not updated right now, you can look at 2,500, which just have been updated. Okay. Yeah, and also the top 10 lists that we produce and, and, and publish are, are just updated in, in that week. So we update 2,500, we, we uh, list, um, uh, we list, uh, we list um, uh, the, to um, the top 10s, in, in different categories, and then you can basically uh, you can basically pick from those that are just just have been updated. But the tip, top ten are based on last week or last month or whatever. Top on the current stock price that we just when we did the calculation on that. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I come with it from a little bit of a different point of view. I come from a more intuitive point of view. I don't make any suggestions. I say to people they should they should think of the companies they know and like. And my my thing is more about ownership. Which companies do you want to own? So it's buy and hold, but it's more about ownership. So it's an economics thinking. Which companies would you, as a person? So do you have to if you want to buy a stock, you have to tell me what they what they produce and what their or what their services are. And if you don't yeah, know that, you can always you know you can always uh, select intuitively. Um, I'm just giving additional information. Okay. Maybe if you worked intuitively, you 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 don't feel that comfortable. Let's, let's say if I say like, oh, in Switzerland, I like uh, UBS, for instance. Mm -hmm. And if I would base my my stock picking uh, decision just on the fact that I like the company, mm -hmm. uh, I would not feel that comfortable. No. Because no, then no. you know, right now, I would probably always buy the popular companies that other people think are popular too, otherwise they wouldn't be popular. And that would also mean that more people are buying them right now. Mm -hmm. So I would at least like to know what are the financials behind those companies. Sure. And sure. for that reason, you could actually go to the website and could see what are the financials. Right. No, it, my idea would be, okay, you know you like UBS, and now you can make a comparison of the financial, you can make a ranking of all of the companies within Switzerland that are competitors of UBS and see yeah. competitor so from you, so e ratio and return on invested capital and yeah. earnings yield and whatever. Exactly. That's my idea is more that you have to start from the idea of knowing what it is and then look at what the, what the numbers are. That's just yeah. my opinion, but I, I think it's very interesting your approach. Yeah, so what you could do here, you could say like, okay, I'm going to look for UBS. Mm -hmm. and when I have UBS here, I see there are diversified capital markets. So I go to the filter, um, mm -hmm. 
I want exactly. to pick large exactly. ones. I go to the industry and say diversified capital markets. Exactly. I go worldwide. I search for stocks. And then I see the others that are in the same industry code. And you can choose Switzerland, just within Switzerland, and just to make a direct comparison. Yeah, you could also select the country Switzerland, but you know there are not that many companies in such a in such an industry code. Okay. Um, what you have to know basically is that diversified capital markets or uh, bank or or UBS is a bank, and then you could go by sector. Sector is is bigger, so you could say like I'm going to look at all the banks in Switzerland. Nice. And then you would then you would have more but it doesn't have an extra large. So you would have to take this, the, the size, uh, the size um, nice. factor away. Nice. And then you look, basically you're looking at Switzerland banks and you would have all of them here uh, rated by them. Very nice. Rank mm -hmm. Impressive. And then of course you can go down. So this is now, this is now all of them that we have in our database. You mentioned uh, you think Tesla is overvalued. How would you be able to see that, for example, in your uh, website? Uh, yeah, the, the easiest is at the moment, the easiest is just to go to Tesla, uh, find the stock. Um, Tesla. This is something which, you know, and then basically you have here Tesla, and he has a value rank of one. I see. That's so it immediately shows it's up. It's growing the fastest, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Growth rate from 100, quite riskily financed, which is not a problem because mm -hmm. this company's growing. So it's 33 is, by the way, also not as bad as people say Tesla is. Right. So they're actually, they're not that badly financed. And if you click on them, you, you, get, you go to the website where you have all the details. Right. So the value rank actually here for Tesla is... Um, is expensive for everything except profits. Now that they're turning a profit, the value is actually not that bad anymore. <laughs> no. what, what do you work out with the value, the intrinsic value of the company or did, how do you do it with the discounted cash flow or how do you, how do you work it out? It's all, it's all basically, you know, if you click on these metrics, you will see the definition. Okay. You can go to the value me metrics and you get all of them here. Right. You know, that's okay. how we call yeah, them. I did see them, yeah. Yeah, so this is how it works. But here, the, but the here I don't see a discount, discounted cash flow model or something like that. Do you, are you making? Yeah, as... discounted cash flow models require the future. Uh, I've decided not to use any personal judgments. So whenever somebody uses a discounted cash flow model, they make judgments about the future. That was my next question, you see, that's why I asked, because you have to look at the discount rate and there's already a problem as well, because it really depends on which discount rate you're taking, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's where my question came from. No, uh, no, because we, don't, we don't do that. You no. know, what I wanted to do is I wanted to have the facts. Yeah. And uh, I know there are companies that are quite good in, uh, in selling research on the future. You know, probably the most dominant player is Morningstar. You know, Morningstar says what they're doing is they're showing or they're calculating how much protection this company has. They call it the mount, you know, the, the mount around, around their fort basically, you know, the how much mouth do they have? And then they compare that to the future cash flow of that company or the value of the company. And those companies that have more mouth and are not that expensive are then companies that they think are worth investing. My problem is I've seen many analysts for my corporate clients and they typically just repeat what the corporate client is telling them. So I, I think the I think the the value added of, of of a guess about the future is not that great. An analyst cannot deviate much from what everybody else thinks because if they deviate uh, too much and make a mistake, they're out of the job. If they make a mistake because everybody else made a mistake too. They can say like, look, everybody else made the same mistake. The company said it; they would go there. They didn't go there. You know, who am I, you know, to blame? Because everybody else thought that. So an analyst actually has to go with the mainstream 
ex, you know, expectation about that company. And for that reason, I think their models are not that interesting. It is different for people that make up their own mind and come to conclusion that the market is someplace wrong. But then it's also their own money, you know? As soon as they start to manage other people's money, they have to be, become careful because otherwise you can blame them for not being mainstream. And because of that problem, I decided not to use um, public stock recommendation based on judgments. Uh, journalists have the same problem. If a journalist says something that is completely out of the ordinary and he's wrong, he has a, a huge problem. If the journalist says something that everybody else says, you know, and it's wrong, it's not a problem. So I felt it's not really worthwhile going after this advice. It's better I run the numbers and I make up my own mind where I think the markets are wrong. Right now, the example was the markets are probably wrong with BMW and Daimler. Yeah, I've, I've had a couple of questions going through my head. It's it's more difficult to formulate them right now all at, at once. Um, did you ever look at the performance of the, let's say, what you just said? Um, because we might have an opinion about something, obviously without making it personal or anything. But uh, for example, myself, if I have an opinion about something, many times I've been proven wrong. Uh, I don't take it personal, but sometimes uh, I can see that uh, an approach to an investment proposition gives a far better return than I thought it would give. Did you do that for your approach as well? Did you look at different performances? Um, I think it, it's really hard to, um, to assess, uh, assess this subjectively. Okay. What, what you can do is you can run large numbers. And when you, when you run large numbers, um, you, can, you know that over time, buying cheaper companies with the method I'm using here gives you an excess return. Having said that, this period now, since the credit crisis, is known for being an exception. So until today, the so-called value investing approach has not worked at all. Uh, actually, it's, it's even worse. Even you know, people that do discounted cash flow models to calculate the value of a company and then buy the companies that they think are cheap have done very poorly over the past 10 years. Okay, and I didn't it was, know that. There was actually an article in the Financial Times just recently how the last really prestigious, how another really prestigious hedge fund uh, focusing on value stocks has gone uh, bank, not bankrupt, has closed their business because they did so poorly over the past 10 years. Okay. So assessing uh, also our performance over, month, over the past 10 years is something, it's not very futile. And we know already that it's not working very well. You have a couple of advantages though. It's known that when you diversify your stocks in equal parts into different stocks, if you have an equal weighting in your portfolio, you tend to do better then if you focus your, then when you weigh the portfolio according to, more, according to market capitalization. So when you do what an index fund does, you typically have an underperformance over time because you tend to have more expensive stocks dominant in your portfolio. Now over the past 10 years, this was not the case. So I, over the past 10 years, when you bought an index fund, let's say the Stanford 500, you did a lot better than the stock pickers because they profited from from the growth stocks, they're called. So they said, like, so it was very easy to say, like, oh, just buy Stanford 500 does a lot better, but this is actually only a certain period. Looking forward, going forward, you know, I think that the picture is a lot more uh, problematic for the Stanford 500 index because it's so heavily weighted on tech stock, tech stock. So basically, what would have to happen is that the uh, performance of the stack talk, uh, tech stocks will continue to outperform everything else over the next 10 years or whatever years you look at the, over the next period. And I think that's a lot less likely than over the past 10 years. Well, there it's obvious, it's a fact. So one thing you have to say right now for yourself is, do I believe the tech stock boom will continue? 
which will guide you to a complete different way of investing than when you say, I think the tech stocks have to be uh, have to be adjusted in their value, have to come back to earth basically over the next 10 years. You know, at one point, you don't know where, of course, when, of course, but they might come down eventually. And if you then decide that this is going to happen, people will actually move their money to value stocks because that's where they get dividends. Did you feel that because of your approach or the value approach, the volatility in your portfolio was therefore less than, for example, compared to other portfolios? It was yeah, a different I think approach. So. Um, I, I, I because think that would be, for me, for example, a very good reason you know, to step into it. Uh, volatility, think, like yeah. you said, when it comes to your own money, is not something that you want to have, isn't it? Probably most likely, less volatility will come from the fact that you're equal weight, that your portfolio is equal weight. It has meant in the past also that there was less upside. Just to, to be con completely honest, there was less upside with my portfolio. But I think the fact that it's equal weight more or less, you know, because I always buy the same amount um, in stocks, I think I had less volatility than you would have with, with an index fund. It's my okay. feeling. Okay. And of course, the, 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 the downside is it was less returns, actually. Yes, yes. <laughs> But that's, you know, that is something that, that one can always make a decision about. Um, the other question I had is that um, of currency uh, problems. Um, I've been investing for a long time and already like 20 years ago, you know, when you made 30% on futures trading uh, and suddenly the currency lost 30%, you basically have made nothing for the year. Um, first of all, do you recognize that? How do you deal with it? Uh, <laughs> my father is such a guy. You know, my father, of course, we live in Switzerland with a strong franc, you know. <laughs> and he always said, look, I, I, need, I need a return in, Swiss, in Swiss francs, you know. And I told him, yeah, but you're buying, you know, German cars. <laughs> you're buying American computers and phones. I mean, you're not buying them in Swiss francs. It's just right. because they've been converted to Swiss francs. Eventually, 50% of what you consume, then he also flies around the world and goes you know, to hotels in other places, is in other currencies. So your, your return doesn't have to be in Swiss francs, first of all, because your consumption is not in Swiss francs. In the last 20 years, of course, it would have been nice to have a return in Swiss franc because the Swiss franc appreciated so much. But that the next 20 years may be completely different. Yep. Right now in Switzerland, we have the biggest outbreak of the pandemic compared to any other country or most of other countries. And it could very well be that eventually people don't wanna park their money in Switzerland anymore. It's possible, don't know. Uh, at that point, the currency could reverse and you would be better off having been diversified because yeah. the return in another currency was better. So I think it's stupid to, uh, to think uh, in terms of one currency. And uh, in order to make uh, my portfolio more transparent, I always show them in different currencies. And that, that's actually then really interesting. When you look at that, you know, you can uh, share my screen one more time so we can see that. Um, so when I, uh, when we go to my website under performance, you can actually see uh, my portfolio, you know, basically what I invested which was until by now 500,000 francs in Swiss francs, that's uh, 500,000 in Swiss francs, which was less in Euro, um, which was slightly more in US dollar, and it was um, less in, in, in uh, British pounds. I always used the conversion rate at the time when I put the money in the portfolio. So it, it's not a, any specific day when we had the currency, it's the day when I actually put the money in portfolio. I said, that's how much it is worth in Euro, that's how much in US dollar. And the result is actually get very different returns. Uh, now yeah. here you don't see a lot of different returns, but I had situations where there was no return in Swiss franc and there was a lot of return in Euro because the Swiss franc appreciated against the Euro. But if you look at that a year later, it may look completely different. Do you update it yearly by exchange rates? Yes, I update the exchange rate uh, uh, yearly, exactly, yep. to calculate how much yep. it's actually worth at that time. Yep. And I update, the ex I use the exchange rate on the day I put money in my portfolio for yep. further investments. On the day I invest, I, I put the money into the portfolio. Right, right. So to make it comparable. 
but your portfolio, but let's say you buy, uh, well, that would be another question. Do you compare, for example, different countries? Like, for example, at the moment, I'm just saying something, uh, Africa is doing very poorly, China is getting uh, up on its feet, Russia is doing less than the United States, therefore you will invest in stocks in the United States. Do you do something like that, market selection? I think, yes, You. this is your strategy, really. However, a strategy, um, it's your strategy, basically. I had the strategy for the past five years or four years uh, to invest in Europe because I wanted to use our system was one of the, one of the reasons. And uh, our system doesn't work with tech stocks. So I decided not to invest in tech stocks because I wanted to show how the system works. And I believe that Europe is underappreciated. Uh, I believe Europe has a lot of values uh, culturally, uh, but also uh, from the society in terms of security and, and reliability. And I'm not so sure about you know, the markets that were really hot over the past five years. You know, I, I just felt less secure there. And for that reason, I decided to invest in Europe. This was my decision. Europe did not as well as other regions. At least, uh, I, don't, I think there was another crash in the emerging markets, so maybe at least it did better than emerging markets, but compared to the US, US, it didn't do as good as the US, as well as the US. Um, but uh, I decided to do that, and uh, to be honest, um, to decide where you're going to invest is impossible to justify with numbers. Okay. Because the, the general expectations and the market consensus of where a region or a country is going is already in the prices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, if a market is more expensive like the US right now, it is because people truly expect more returns from the US, higher growth in profits. Uh, to bet against that is always a bet against the majority. You can do that individually, and I, that's how I did it. I decided, I, I think Europe is undervalued. I decided to invest in Europe. It may or may not go right, but it's impossible to justify with numbers because the consensus is already in the valuation today. So let's say you, you've made your choice and let's say you're choosing two or three different continents or countries. So coming back to the currency question, you would then buy a company in dollars, one in Euro, and let's say one in Japanese yen. At the end of the day, you would balance it out all back to the Swiss francs, right? That is, is no, that... no, no, I typically have a stockbroker with uh, different accounts. Yep. US dollar, Euro, and Swiss francs is what I have, and British pounds, I think, is what I have right now. And um, uh, of course, when I want to show the performance, I have to show it in a, in a certain currency. Well, for example, it, for tax. I can do it in yen, even though yeah. all the stocks are in euro. You know, yeah. it's the currency is actually it doesn't really have an impact. Um, okay. It doesn't really have an impact. Of course, there are people that say I want the Swiss franc return, and their asset manager then have to hedge their foreign currency risks. Yeah. But this all costs a lot of money. You know, hedging yeah. costs easily two percent of your annual return, yeah. and if the returns are so low as they are right now, this is half of your profit. So I would really advise against that. Okay. Yeah. May I ask which broker you're using? Because that is another problem that I'm having. I looked at your website. I looked at Moneyland. Uh, I did see all the Swiss brokers. Uh, obviously, there are certain personal preferences. Like, for example, I find it easier to have a Swiss broker rather than an international one. But they're quite expensive. There's stamp duty to be paid. I don't like interactive brokers. I think it's a horrible platform customer service is very bad but i do need like a multi-currency account uh, so i looked at strateo bitcoin swiss uh, a couple of others uh, the hero uh, the ones that you mentioned on the website um, may i ask which one are you using for example are you, are you in, based in switzerland yes okay um well it, the website really tells you um uh, you know the stock brokers we we like um, yes, I saw that and I went yeah, through it. So list. this is really, yeah. you know, I have Strate Strateo and uh, Bank 2 Plus. Yeah. I found that Strateo sometimes is, is the more convenient platform, but sometimes doesn't have the stocks I want to buy. So there's less of a coverage as 
uh, Bank 2 Plus or Cash. I think it's Cash or Bank 2 Plus. Um, you can go to uh, PostFinance as well, which is the platform from Swissquote, but yeah. made simpler. And then I think you can also go to Swiss code. So, I mean, it's really, it's, it's a personal preference. It's basically where you feel more comfortable. I think uh, the most elaborate platform is probably Swiss code. Thank you. Which I don't have right now. For some or you people. can become a member of mine too. I hope we're going to work together one day. You can become a member of mine because that was my point of getting everyone invested. And I realized that you couldn't get everyone invested because all the banking fees, the commissions, and the depot bureau would just, or inactivity fees would eat up everything, and you would, have, it would be a zero sum game. So I went and I talked to 17 banks, and I made one with one bank, I made now a deal, and I'm hoping to make it with more. That if you're a member by me, that you get much better rates no depot bureau, no inactivity fees. So that, but that is part of the whole idea of how to get people invested and actually to not lose money as cash on a bank account. So um, I'm surprised that you said that about Stradio because it's that stride behind Stradio is Saxo. And with Saxo, you can ask for any, you can ask for any uh, equity to be, to be traded and they'll add it to their, to their data bank or till their, so, so Teres, tell me more about your uh, offering. We have to close soon because it's an hour. Um, no, 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 I, no, but this is your show, not mine. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to steal no, your no, show. No, I'm interested to hear about it because it's interesting for me too. So uh, how would that work? You say member. So you could become a member and then you there's a trading button on my website and that goes directly to the, the bank and you're flagged as a member of Invested.ch. So right now, people, any private investor is treated as a capital investor. But as soon as I reach a th certain threshold of number of investors, all investors will become then institutional investors. With what is your website? Invested.ch. Investors? .ch. What I'm just doing, I'm just writing it over with Microsoft right now because there's a lot. It's slow and blah, blah, blah. And I read it myself because I was programming for 26 years and it's it's not an optimal website, but there's a lot of good things that you can use on there. There's a lot of sorting and, and filtering. Like, as I said, like to, you can't compare PU ratios of Novartis and UBS, right? And so you want to compare PE ratios of within the industry, within the country. And that's the kind of tools that I, I developed. And what is the bank that you work with now? It, I kind of have a confidentiality. Oh, it's um, not yet public? It, it's not, it's, pardon me? It's not yet public? I mean... Yes, it is. I mean, it, sure, it's, it, I mean, the bank? Yeah, I mean, if you go to uh, investors.ch, you cannot see... Uh, yeah, no, not after. until you become a member. But I actually don't even want to keep it like that. I want it to be all... I want to use Blink. I don't know if you know that from Six. It, it's a, it's an interface, a, a standardized interface that works with all of the banks. And so I'm talking to Credit Suisse and I'm talking to Migro Bank and I'm talking to other banks because I like, I don't want to just say which bank you have to change with, but all of those banks have to make the same conditions that I have now. No, I don't want any depot deposit. I don't want any inactivity fee and I don't want, and I want low trading fees. So right now a trading fee as a minimum is 18 Swiss francs over, over invested.ch. Okay, interesting. Sounds really interesting, Terrence. We should really talk about that. <laughs> I know we have to talk because I love what you're doing okay. and it would add so much to what I'm doing. Okay. And or, or the other way around, maybe I can add to what you're doing. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. But I'm sorry, this is your show and I'm so sorry I didn't mean to no talk about it. No, no, I'm also interested to hear new things. Jan, do you have anything else to add? Otherwise, uh, I, I appreciate what uh, Theresa is trying to do. Uh, I actually looked at that for, from many angles because we invest in different countries. So I am involved in currency hedging and, and whatnot. I also looked at different brokerage uh, accounts and uh, the one currently coming up to the front was TD Ameritrade. Uh, they don't charge any fees whatsoever, zero commission on trades. Uh, zero platform fees, uh, zero inactivity fees. So they're really 
Great. There's one disadvantage that if you die uh, during uh, having a, an account with them, you actually pay 40% estate tax to the United States. But that is something you need to, to take care of. But only after 2.5 million, huh? I mean, it's... There is no, a... that's only for US citizens. For foreigners, it's 60,000. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And uh, because that is obviously very important, um, estate tax is, uh, is otherwise relatively small, but you don't want to be surprised. And like I said in the, in the, in the introduction, this is a long-term thing. Uh, even if I pass away, the pension fund or kind of thing that I would send up, want to set up is, uh, is going to exceed my lifespan. So I don't want to be surprised by a 40% tax rate. I also don't want to be surprised by um, you know, inactivity fees or high deposit fees or high, I mean, 18 Swiss francs per trade to me is a tremendous amount of money per trade. But only, of course, if you do more than two trades a year. If you have got, let's say, two trades a year, it doesn't mean anything. But if you trade on a regular basis, your commission is going to eat up your account. Sure. Uh, so yeah, but very, I, I'm not I'm looking for traders. I'm looking for owners, not investors, not traders. I, I don't think I, 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 I don't think anyone can beat the market. Hmm. Okay, very good. I think it's a good uh, finding statement, closing statement. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I thank hope we'll see each other again on one of yes. the future. Thank you so much for organizing this. I much appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Take Thank care. you. Yeah, no, it was Bye. really very good, Jan. Thank you very much. Thank you really, too. I love what you, um, Jan and Herman. Thank you very much. I I really like what you're doing. Um, I really do want to talk to you. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll make myself scarce so you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.